good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. First of all, I just want to thank Harris County Public Health for putting together this conference on such an important topic. And it's been wonderful to hear from people from multiple disciplines just coming together to really understand violence and really understand what we can do to prevent it in our community. And so I just, um, I, I'm just, our research team is really grateful to be here and to be invited to present some of our work that we're doing. And so my name is Carrie Kane and I'm a research professor at Baylor College of Medicine. And I've had the privilege to work with a team of researchers on a CDC funded project for firearms prevention. And the work that I'm presenting today, today, it's funded by the CDC. Dr. Bindi Nayak Mathuria, she's a pediatric surgeon at Baylor College of Medicine. She's the principal investigator of this study. And the goal of the study is to integrate firearm violence data from multiple data sources to understand individual and community level factors to help us prioritize targeted prevention efforts. And so first of all, I just want to let you guys know we are still in the middle of conducting this study. And so please note that the data that I'm presenting to you today, it's preliminary and the full analysis is still underway. And so please do not quote or distribute these preliminary results. Thank you. For those of you attending this conference, I mean, you understand that violence in America is a problem. And firearms are one of the most lethal and harmful mechanisms of violence. Compared to other developed countries, the United States stands out for its high levels of gun violence. Disparities in gun violence exist where black Americans are 10 times more likely to die by gun homicide compared to whites. These considerable racial disparities are rooted in structural racism, which we will discuss later in this presentation, and which was also addressed in the morning session as well. Nearly half of all women in the United States are murdered by a current or former intimate partner, and over half of those homicides are committed using a gun. A woman is five times more likely to be murdered when her abuser has access to a firearm. And firearm violence, as, as has been told, Mayor Turner has mentioned it, many of the speakers at this conference have, have discussed this. This is why Harris County Public Health is putting on this annual conference, is firearm violence is a public health emergency. In May of this year, the CDC released this data, and you can see the rise in both suicide and homicide rates over the past decade. Especially note, the sharp rise in homicides between 2019 and 2020. And then notice the steady rise of suicides throughout the, the decade. In firearm related injuries, they're now the leading cause of non-natural death for children ages zero to 19. And so two reputable journals, actually multiple papers are, have been published on this this year. Um, I just pulled out some uh, contents from some journal articles from the New England Journal of Medicine and from the American Academy of Pediatrics. The figure here, it's from the New England Journal of Medicine article, and you can see the various causes of injury. Firearm violence was previously the second leading cause of death, and motor vehicle collisions was the first leading cause of death until 2019. In the pediatric study, they quote this, it says in 2019, firearm injuries surpassed motor vehicle collisions to become the leading cause of death for youth aged zero to 19 years in the United States after excluding deaths due to prematurity and congenital anomalies. And so when we think about it, the rapid decline in motor vehicle collision deaths among youth, it's largely been attributed to mandated use of age appropriate appropriate child restraints, so talking about car seats and booster seats, seat belts, and then also the addition of other engineering that's gone into making our vehicles more safe for us to drive in. Also, you know, law enforcement, there's multiple factors that have gone into leading to these great reductions in motor vehicle collisions. 
policy, engineering, education. And although the interventions used to address motor vehicle collision deaths are going to be different than those which are needed to address firearm deaths, the same tenets of public health apply, including a combination of research, public education, community-based initiatives, industry safety standards, and accountability, governmental coordination, investment, and legislation. There are many different types of gun violence, and most of the data that is reported on gun violence is fatal data. And so you can even see back the slides that I had reported, all of these have all been on fatal data. However, there are significantly more non-fatal injuries from firearms than there are from fatal. And so especially with the advances in medical treatment, more people are surviving these injuries, and so the burden of non-fatal injuries is so much higher. There are also multiple types of firearm injuries. Each have different risk and protective factors and will require different prevention strategies. Assault and homicide, they're by far the most common in both fatal and non-fatal firearm injuries. These include interpersonal violence and mass shootings. And while mass shootings, they're tragic, um, they represent just a small portion of those assault and homicide firearm injuries. The interpersonal violence represents much more of assault and homicide. Um, there's also unintentional injuries. Sometimes those are called accidental. Um, for those of us in the injury prevention field, we typically try to stay away from the term accidental because it indicates that this could not be prevented, that it just was something that happened. And so we call this unintentional because many of these injuries are preventable. Um, the next is suicide, which as you will see whenever I present our Harris County data, um, it is rising among our adolescents. And then another type that we included in our study that's often not reported on is bystander or stray bullet. And so these injuries happen, it's kind of, in a sense, a wrong place at a wrong time. And so bullets that come through apartment buildings, through windows that injure someone, you're at the gas station filling up, the, the bullet was not intended for you, however you were the victim and got injured. That is what we consider a bystander or standby injury. And so this is not just a national problem. Firearms are a problem in Houston. And so daily, we see headlines on firearm violence. And you know, this morning, Mayor Turner, he, he stated many initiatives that the city is doing to curb firearm violence in the city, which those are so important and so needed. When we look at the city crime data, this is a, a graph that shows um, the city of Houston murder rate from 1995 to 2021. And the crime data shows that the murder rate in Houston has been rising. And if you look at the trend, it's continuing to rise. You can see that jump, especially between 2019 and 2021. And so I personally, I'm a registered nurse, um, now <laughs> I'm a researcher, and so I come from a hospital background. I previously worked as a pediatric trauma nurse on the trauma floor at one of our level one pediatric um, trauma hospitals. And while the data that we collect through the hospitals, through the trauma registry, it's vital and it's critical for us in understanding this, that's only one small piece of the picture to understand firearm violence in our community. And so for, in order for us to really have a full picture and understand, we need to integrate data from many more sources, not just from these one specific sources. And so the research team that I'm working with is seeking to answer these questions about firearm injuries in our community. How many total firearm injuries are happening, fatal and non-fatal? Where are these injuries happening? Who are they happening to? And why are they happening? And from our perspective in the hospital, we don't have the full picture of this. And so there is, there's not a comprehensive repository or surveillance system for all firearm injuries, including both non-fatal and fatal. It just does not exist right now, but it's important. 
And so in order to prevent firearm injuries, we really need to take a public health approach to injury prevention. And so we are using a public health framework of defining the problem, identifying risk and protective factors, developing and testing prevention strategies, and then assuring widespread adoption. And then I would also add, that's not on this slide, but evaluating that these strategies are effective in making changes as needed based on those evaluations. But really with firearm violence, we are still at the point of needing to define the problem and identifying risk and protective factors. And so for this, the CDC studied fund, the CDC funded study that I am presenting, it seeks to integrate data from multiple sources to better define the problem of firearm violence in our community. And so as you can see on the slide, um, we're integrating sources from, we have the two, two of the large medical schools in our community, Baylor College of Medicine and UT Health McGovern School of Medicine, and then their corresponding hospitals that they are affiliated with, which would be Ben Taub Hospital, Memorial Hermann Hospital, Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital, and Texas Children's Hospital. These hospitals are level one trauma centers. And so from the hospital data that we're gathering, we've been gathering data on non-fatal injuries, fatal injuries, residents and shooting locations, shooting intent, and social correlates, and then also as much information that we can find on the shooter. And then we've been combining those also with medical examiner records. Because if you think about it with firearm, firearms, these are lethal means. And so many of the victims of firearm violence are not going to make it to that trauma center. And so from that trauma data, that we're missing this whole other piece of data of those that may have died at the scene. And so from the medical examiner records, we're collecting information on fatal injuries, residents and shooting locations, shooting intent, and then social correlates. And then we're also from Harris, um, the Houston Police Department and Harris County Sheriff's Office getting data on all crimes involving guns with or without injury and death in sh the shooting locations. And that data is also important because some of these these injuries we may never see in the hospital, they may never see in the medical examiner. And so it's important to really integrate this data to understand this problem. And then we're also looking at using Census Bureau and then also Houston Galveston Area Council, the planning agency, their data to understand neighborhood level risk factors and hotspots using geospatial analysis. And so I'm gonna be presenting some preliminary data that we've done from the study. But our goal is really in, in, in pulling together and integrating all of this data is so that we can strategically address firearm violence. And so it's multifaceted, as we know, and it requires intervention at all sociological levels. And so this is just a picture of the sociological model where we look at different individual factors, relationship factors, community factors, and societal factors that impact firearm violence and firearm violence prevention. So now I'm going to present the data um, that we have, the pediatric data. So we're looking at children between zero and 17 years. And this preliminary data is data that is from the level one trauma centers and the medical examiner's office. And so we, we have not, this is why we're saying it's preliminary because it has not added in the police record data just yet. And so, from the trauma centers and the medical examiner's office, that data we from zero to 17 years, or years of age, between 2008 and 2020, there were 485 victims of firearm violence. And you can see that there's a 76% increase in firearm injuries among children in Harris County over those years. In 2020 alone, more than 200 children and adolescents were injured or killed by firearms in Harris County. You can also see in the bar graph the different types of injury um, that happened to children over those years. When we look at the shooting intent, um, first I wanna talk about non-fatal injuries, because I mentioned before, even though most of the research, most of the reports on firearm injuries are on fatal injuries, 
When we look at the non-fatal, they were three times more common than fatal. In, that, in other words, one in four children who were shot um, have died. And so we've got those, the, the, all these children that are surviving these injuries. When we look at pediatric, the shooting intent, assaults make up over half of the injuries that we're seeing in Harris County among children. Unintentional makes up 19%, which is quite large when you think about how preventable those injuries are. Suicides are 6%. Bystander, as I mentioned, the stray bullet, that's 10%. And then 10% were unclear. And these were, after reviewing the medical record, after reviewing the ME record, we were really unable to determine exactly what intent that was, whether the data was missing or just it was undistinguishable. So those were categorized as unclear. And then Russian roulette made up 1%. We put that as its own separate category because really it's hard to determine, does that go into suicide self-harm? Does that go into intentional? Does that go into unintentional? So we placed that as its own category. When we look at the demographics, again, there were 485 children and adolescents, and 84% were male. When you look at the racial and ethnic breakdown, and these are, I've reported the crude rates, and they're adjusted by the population by 100,000 100, children in the population, we see that black males are disproportionately affected by firearm violence in our community. Also, when you look at the breakdown by ages, we see that our adolescents make up 70% of those injuries. And so, but even, I mean, significant, our little, our babies, zero to five, made up 8%. And so, we see that all children are affected. When we look at just looking at males, and then looking separately at females, and so separating their data, you can see a little bit of differences among the proportions of the intent among males and females. For males, more than half of those injuries were assault injuries. For females, it was a little bit less than half, but you look and see that suicide among females was 13%, and those bystander injuries were 17%, whereas for males, suicides made up 5% of the total injuries to males, and bystander made up 8%. And then this is looking at the intents across age. And, you know, one thing to point out, you definitely see that big line right there among 15 to 17 year olds for assaults. But also I'd like to point out the two stars that show that unintentional injuries are higher proportionately among younger children. And so even though there may be more of them among the older, when you look proportionate to all the other injuries, that is what's impacting our younger kids, our zero to five and six to 11 year olds. And then when we look across race and ethnicity, you'll see that black and Hispanic children are impacted by assault, whereas suicide is highest among white children. And then looking at our data that we got from the trauma centers, 31%, so a third of the injuries that were treated in the hospitals, those were superficial injuries. And so, but 13%, which those are gonna be our most severe, were impacted the head. And then you can see the other severity would be the chest and the abdomen, which made up 10 and 11%. 27% of children were admitted to the intensive care units, meaning that their injuries were extremely severe, that they had to be in the ICU. 58% had received operations during their time in the hospital. And then looking at what happened to these children afterwards, 24% had residual symptoms from their injuries after three months. And those are ones that we were able to find the follow-up data on, and so that is likely going to be a higher number because we did not have complete data on that. And then 12% died, and so as I mentioned, many of these children are surviving these injuries, but of those that died, 65% died because they had brain injury. We also looked at social correlates, and so these that I'm reporting here are proxies for poverty, and we found that 
of all the firearm injuries for pediatrics, 86% were on public or had no insurance. 16% were, had private insurance, and this is out of 411 children. We had some missing data there, and I'll talk about the problem of missing data in a little bit. Um, when you break it down and look, among assault and bystander, 87% had public or no insurance, and 79% of unintentional had public or no insurance. 39% um, lived in apartments, 61% lived in houses. For assault and bystander, 49% were in apartments, 26% for unintentional, and 10% for suicide. And then 52% of the children came from parents with single parent households, and 48% um, came from dual parent households. We look at assault and bystander, it was 60% from single parent households, 43% for unintentional, and 35% for suicide. And so I want to pause here and, and talk about structural violence. There are considerable racial disparities, and they are rooted in poverty and structural and cult cultural racism. This results in victim blaming and biased perceptions of firearm-related violence in marginalized populations. And so social and economic inequalities are the root causes of firearm violence and need to be addressed. And so this is income inequality, poverty, underfunded public housing, under-resourced public services, underperforming schools, lack of opportunity and perception of homelessness, easy access to firearms. And these are all caused by racist policies that target communities by creating segregated and underinvested neighborhoods. And individuals living in these communities have, in, have unequal access to opportunity. And this was discussed very in, in detail this morning by Mr. Blow on the connection between violence and poverty. And it is something that we cannot ignore and that needs to be addressed. For other social correlates, we looked at reported alcohol or drug use. And so among those that were reported, there was 29%, and we did not find it any information about this in 25% of the cases. Um, for those that reported a history of interpersonal violence, there were 30%. We did not find it anything about interpersonal violence in 28%. For those that reported criminal activity during the shooting, there was 16%. We did not find information about this in 30% of, 2% of the cases. And then those that reported gang affiliation were 11%. We did not find this in almost half, in any information about this in almost half of the cases in 47%. Um, and really, other studies on firearm violence, they've shown that the most consistent predictor of future violence is violent behavior, and so it's important that we understand this and that it's, we, we're able to find this information because it's such a strong predictor. And so one of our takeaways, because of all of this, the missing data that we found once we pulled together all this, th these different data sets, is that trauma centers should make efforts to collect and document this data because it's important for us for predicting and for helping to understand prevention of violence. We also looked at the shooting location and we found that um, for, for these, 83% and 93% of suicides could have potentially been prevented by secure or out of home storage. And I say that because when you think about where the shooting location happened, you'll notice that 90% of the suicides happened in the home or home of a family friend, and 76% happened uh, of unintentional shootings happened in the home or the home of a family friend. And then we look too within the cars as well. And so it's important for us to think about, we're thinking about prevention and where access to the, where the shooting happened or where access to this gun, especially for suicides and for unintentional injuries, really thinking about secure house firearm storage because that could have prevented almost one out of four of these pediatric firearm injuries. This data here, we're looking specifically at this, the pediatric suicide and self-harm cases. 
we found that 65% of the children had prior known mental illness, and the most common mental illness that was reported was depression. Um, only 20% had reported suicidal ideation prior to the suicide or self-harm event. 20% were able to access the firearm even though it was securely locked. So they knew the combination, they knew how to reach that firearm. 32% had known drug use and only 4% had known alcohol use. We definitely are seeing higher um, with the firearm related violence with drug use compared to alcohol use. And then Family-related stressors, there were 30% that had reported that there was a prior family-related stressor, and that is, I mean, these are things that happen in almost every household, but an argument with a parent, the parent may have been in a fight or a divorce, or parents took away the child's cell phone, and then that shortly afterwards was when the suicide or the self-harm event happened. One of my colleagues on the research team, Dr. Ned Levine, he, um, he conducts geospatial analysis, and this was his preliminary analysis using the pediatric data. And I do find that it's quite interesting whenever we look at the different types of, of intents for firearm injuries, you can see with the intentional, it's, and also the bystander, both of those, when we're looking at where the location is happening, they're concentrated in the urban center. They're concentrated within Beltway 8. But then when we look at unintentional, you'll notice it shifts out a little bit more and it's shifting out more towards the suburbs. And so we've got some within the urban center of Houston, but it's also the, that spot is moving out where it's more in the suburb areas. And then when we look at suicide, suicide is happening much more in the suburban areas of Houston, and then also onto the rural areas of Houston as well. And so one of the things that we moving forward are doing, as I mentioned before, because this is still preliminary and we're still in the middle of the study, but we are looking at some of these geospatial, you know, some of the using census data, using Houston Galveston Area Council data to really understand some of these neighborhood factors and what may be some of the contributors to some of these differences that we're seeing across the different shooting intents. And so again, as I've said it many times, this is preliminary data. And so, but taking what we have known or what we are finding so far and really thinking through that social ecological model of how, you know, what are some of these correlates? What are ways we can prevent this? It's multifaceted, as I mentioned earlier, each different intent is going to take a different approach. There may be some um, approaches that, that span all of these different types of intents, but there may be other approaches that are specific to suicide self-harm prevention, specific to unintentional firearm pr injury prevention. And so right here, we've taken some of the factors that we've noted preliminarily in this data and put them in looking at the individual factors, relationship, community and societal. And so this is a pediatric firearm suicide prevention framework. Um, and again, just taking the factors that we're seeing. And then we've got a different framework using the social e ecological model, looking at unintentional injury. And again, you know, that was the younger kids are proportionately injured more in those and looking at access to firearms in the home. It happened more in the suburban areas. And then looking at the different laws that may, Texas has a cap law, but it's poorly enforced. And so, so far, some of my rec recommendations for this are first, it's important, that I think this, this conference is showing the importance of this, but creating and increasing and maintaining multidisciplinary collaborations. So between public health, between healthcare, injury prevention, law enforcement, firearm professional organizations, 
retailers. I mean, I could go on schools, early child care centers. There's so many more, but we need to work. We cannot work in silos. We need to work together to address these issues. Um, also, there are many data improvements. You know, the study, it, you know, is kind of a, you know, this dream of being able to integrate all of this data and having these rich data sets. And once we've integrated the data so far, we're finding a lot of holes in the data, a lot of missing data, a lot of unknowns. And so some of the recommendations there would be to create consistent terms and definitions across agencies and databases to improve and expand the data elements captured by the different agencies, to improve and expand data accessibility to all sources of firearm injury surveillance data, and then to link and integrate existing firearm-related injury data sources. And then the third recommendation is to work towards long-term social, political, and cultural change. Prevention of violence, it occurs along a continuum. It begins in early childhood. Me as a pediatric nurse, I worked previously as a school nurse, and that's kind of what made me really passionate. Now my research focus, even this study, we're looking across the full spectrum of childhood, but I'm really passionate about the zero to three age, because I think, you know, all this begins early, and it begins helping, helping families to raise stable and emotionally healthy children. These children need to be in communities that help support raising stable and emotionally, um, emotionally healthy children. And so, we need to address these things, especially since so many of these issues are structural, as we mentioned before. You know, growing up in these environments also impacts these kids. And so by really taking this multidisciplinary approach and working together across this continuum is, is critical. But I'm particularly passionate about early childhood. <laughs> I'll just put that out there. And so in summary, Firearm injuries for children, they are on the rise in greater Houston, especially in the past two years. And we think about the stress that has happened to families over the past two years. Um, this is likely not surprising. And so, but we really need to address these factors. Um, in children and adolescents, assault and homicide is the most common. But 20% of the injuries were unintentional or accidental. Um, combined with suicide, safe out-of-home firearm storage could have potentially prevented one in four pediatric injuries and deaths. Disparities in racial and ethnic groups, gender and socioeconomic status exist regarding shooting intent. Social, individual, and neighborhood correlates can serve as risk factors and protective factors that guide injury prevention program planning. And then trauma centers and that's specifically because that's where I come from as a trauma center and so but other also other agencies but we should be recording more risk factor and shooting intent information so that we can improve ongoing firearm injury surveillance and so that is what I have for you guys oh, oh let me oh sorry I have one more slide that I want to add in Let's see oh it's not moving forward Well, my final slide that I have in here, for some reason, oh, there it goes, okay, is I, I do want to thank the research team. As you can see, this study has multiple collaborators across multiple agencies, you know, and this is just a start of us working together to address these issues. And so um, we've, we've worked with people, you know, from Baylor College of Medicine, from UT Health, um, people from the medical examiner's office, also um, working you know, at, the, at the level one trauma centers with Harris County Forensic Science Institute, the Houston Police Department, Harris County Sheriff's Department, Houston Fire Department to get data. And, um, and then again, we just appreciate the funding from the Centers for Disease Control so that we can understand these injuries and address them in Harris County. Thank you. And I'll, we've got time, I believe, a little bit of time to take a few questions. Yes, ma'am. 
suicide and bystander. Yeah, well, one is, I mean, one of the thoughts is if you think about it, because 87% of the injuries were males. And so, and the leading, the leading cause of violence among males was the assault. And so part of that is the assault injuries among, among females are making up a less proportion. And so that brings it down. But also, I mean, just thinking through mental health issues among, I mean, I mean, I mean when you look at them together, more males compared to females are being injured or are, are, are being injured or dying of suicide. And so that's something to say. But whenever we really, you know, when you look proportionately compared to those assaults, there's much more males dying of assault. But also, I mean, we're in a mental health crisis right now. And I think for females, we you know, we see that when we take out the males and we really look at them. And then the bystander one, like, honestly, I don't know, because that one's such a wrong place, wrong time, you know, where, where they're at. And it's interesting that, that the, the bystander is impacting more females than males because, too, when we looked at geospatially, and again, this, me just talking off, my, off the cuff, but when you looked geospatially, you know, we saw that as far as where that's happening, both for the assaults and for the bystander, those are happening in the urban area. So it's not as if those are happening in different places, but assaults are proportionally so much higher for males, but then these bystander, like the females are getting injured as bystanders and may not be the intended recipient of that bullet. And so, yes, me, or one behind and then all. That's true. Yes. That's true. That's true. Yeah. It, yeah, I guess we shouldn't quite say wrong place, wrong time. There are reasons for that. We're just saying the bullet was not intended for that person. Yeah. Right, right. And I think if we looked, I don't have the data. I, I also sit on the Harris County Child Fatality Review Team where we review every child death um, in the county. And when we look at suicides among females, that is true. I don't have the overall suicide rate to know what percentage of those are. But yes, more often females are not using firearms, but it's proportionately um, you know, in this study we did find, and some of those may also be, I mean, when we looked at the suicide data, obviously because firearms are such a lethal means, the mortality rate is so much higher for suicides compared to any of those other intents. Yeah, yes, yes, and, and the accessibility is also another issue, and so there's just that's the thing we're at, we're just at the very tip of this study and i just as we get more data especially like getting the adding in the police data and and the the sheriff's office data i you know hope that we can continue to fill in some of these holes that we're having in our data because we really want to be data driven and guided on how we're going to strategically address these in the county and so um, but these are great questions. We ha I think we had some online questions. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so the one is on the social correlates um, slide. Gain affiliation was not found in 47% of cases versus 11% found. Do you think this has to do um, because a victim or perpetrator is scared of getting arrested for gang aff affiliation or gang membership? That could be potentially. I mean, <laughs> this was one of those. I mean, let me go back and see the exact number of, we had, I think the person who wrote the question even mentioned it. There was so much not reported on a lot of these social correlates. Yeah, 47%, we weren't able to even find whether or not there was gang affiliation. And so, and it may be because, you know, socially or, or, or you know, fear of prosecution that wasn't reported. And so, but most, Honestly, I think a lot of times that's something we just ha aren't asking about. 
And it's something that, you know, whenever, and that, that came, all of the social correlates, most of those came from the trauma data, the pediatric trauma centers. And so those are just things that we may, as nurses, you know, at the bedside are not thinking about, not asking about. And so they're not documented in the chart. And so, but it, but it also may be because of protection as well. That's true. Any other questions online? No? Okay. That's true, and that, as far as looking at schools, that is probably something that my colleague Ned Levine, who's going to look at the neighborhood level factors and the geospatial factors, is he's looking at because schools we would consider a protective factor, you know. To be honest with you, like I would consider a school is like you know having a school in your neighborhood is 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 good. That's a protective factor, and so he will, as we look at that, that would be considered one of the protective factors. But again. I didn't, you know, as far as with the data that I presented today, this was what came from the Emmy's office and the trauma centers. And so we didn't have a lot of the information on the schools. But again, I mean, even what I mentioned before, like we, we've got to find a way, we've got to work together. We can't work in silos and schools are important partners, you know, especially with what y'all are seeing coming in. And so, yeah, thank you for being here. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, when we looked at, let me see, I don't know if my slides are still up or not. Um, when we looked at the differences in, in shooting intent, bystander and assault homicide were more concentrated in the urban area. But then when we look at unintentional, so that would be, you know, many of those cases were that a child found a gun in the home and they either, you know, were playing with it, unintentionally shot themselves, unintentionally shot their sibling. Um, and so for those injuries, it seemed there was more, the spread was a little bit wider and it spread more into the suburban areas. And then for suicides, when we looked at the spread of suicides, I mean, it was kind of concentrated, sadly, like all over, but it, it extended more into suburban areas and then to the rural areas. For suicides <sighs> yeah yeah with that one I mean I honestly you know part of this some of that when you looked at the suicide data and who is dying by suicide and when we look at what we talked about before the concentrations of who's in the urban centers and so what what the what you mentioned earlier ma'am who is in the urban centers, in the more suburban rural areas, it may be high, a higher white population. You know, I mean, that, that may be one reason. I don't know exactly, because when we look at white males are the highest um, percentage of our suicide deaths. And so that is potentially, you know, it may be just where they live, who they live, you know, and so, but, and, there are racial disparities, you know, that we're seeing in the different types of, of shooting intent. And that one is much higher among white males. And so I don't know, you know, I, I honestly am not sure if there's something also access to social support, you know, may also be some of the, when we look at access to mental health care, there's so many different reasons why um, it may be more concentrated in these outer areas where they're not able, most of, when you look at Houston and our resources, like we are a very, you know, very resource rich community, you know, even though like we are, it's underfunded for sure for mental health care, but like in the city, you know, I mean, 
I mean, our medical facilities are all concentrated right there in the center, you know? And so access is another issue. And so access to those supports and that mental health support is probably, these are, I mean, I'm just kind of speaking through, we haven't really like systematically looked through what that could be, but that those may be some of the reasons. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and if we don't have any more questions, this is a great discussion. And again, I'm we're grateful to be a part of this conversation and hope to keep it going. And um, I'm, I'm hopeful for what is happening in our county and that we will reduce these deaths that we're seeing among children. And so thank you for your time. Appreciate it.